So as we get into Advent, one of the things you see a lot in Advent is this idea of what's called apocalyptic literature. Uh, you ran into it this morning in that second reading with like the melting of everything to the elemental, which is fire and all this sort of stuff. And I think when, it, when we encounter it, I think two things occur to people. One, they don't know what to do with that, right? When the Bible's being particularly bible -y, with all this sort of weird imagery and stuff that's hard to relate to. Um, and two, I think a lot of people wonder, like, why are we talking about this in Advent? Like, we're supposed to be prepared for Christmas, and Christmas is about birth and life and Jesus and a little baby. Why are we talking about the melting of earth? Well, to understand that, we've got to delve into apocalyptic texts. But before we delve into what it is and how one tries to navigate it, I think it's important to talk about how one does not navigate it. Now, I grew up mainline Protestant, technically Episcopalian, not Lutheran, but Episcopalians and Lutherans are united in their complete avoidance of apocalyptic literature, right? We just don't preach on it, we don't talk about it, we don't do Bible studies on the book of Revelation, we, we just don't, right? We all were taught, you just read the Bible, and when you get to that book of Revelation, just close it there and don't keep reading, because it's just crazy. Okay? And I get the initial instinct to just sort of push it out of there. Part of the problem, though, is that, like, you have it scattered throughout the Bible, too, right? Especially in the Old Testament, you have these moments where you're just like, whoa, what's going on here? And, and I get the instinct because our evangelical brethren have gone to a bad, bad place with it, right? Because our evangelical brethren, even though they are all about, or they say they're all about being literal, then jumps into books like the book of Revelation or any of these other apocalyptic things and starts being like, this equals that. And this equals that. And this equals that. And that is why you should vote for my guy. What? Because that other person, man, he's awful. Whatever that other person is with whatever that other thing is. For whatever election they're talking about or group they're talking about or place they're talking about because they try to assign these values to it. But when you do that, you're completely missing the entire genre of apocalyptic literature. And just like any form of literature, if you read it out of the context of which it was meant, you're not going to get the point. If you try to read poetry the way you read an owner's manual, you're going to be really lost. And if you try to write an owner's manual to love, good luck with that. Okay? There's a reason you have different types of genres. So you might ask yourself, what does apocalyptic literature look like? Now this is hard because I will say that I draw a line right about the top of the millennial generation. And I say there's three groups. You have those who are boomers and silence. Okay? So you're 55-ish up. You have the group that's like 42 and down. I'm not going to forget you Xers. I know that's your great fear because you're the middle child of all the generations. Okay, millennials and down. And then you have the Gen Xers in between. Those who are older than Gen X, you grew up in a time in which there was very, very little apocalyptic literature. You did have 1984 and you did have Brave New World. But outside of Brave New World in 1984, you're hard pressed to point out another major work of apocalyptic literature. Okay? Maybe Logan's Run. For those of you who are under the Gen X group, okay, we have been steeped in apocalyptic literature. I mean, we've had vampires, we've had zombies, we've had werewolves, we've had all the things, right? And not only have we, like, run the gamut of everything you might dress up with at Halloween, we've gone beyond that. Because then once, like, lower-end millennials and upper-end Gen Zs got around, then they added the Hunger Games, Divergent, the fifth column. They just kept adding, right? You have all these different things, one after another, after another, after another has come out, and the Gen Xers, like Gen Xers are to do, stand between the two and sort of make fun of both. Right? Because they understand what the millennials and everyone's doing, and they find it hilarious that the boomers are not following this, and yet they didn't do it themselves, so they're like, oh, that's cute, you have zombies now, yay for you. Okay? And the very Gen X middle child way of approaching the world can appreciate both. Okay? I'm not a Gen Xer, by the way. Um, but here's the thing. 
Why apocalyptic literature exists is the biggest thing you need to know about how to approach it. Apocalyptic literature exists when a group, it's usually a younger group, but it could be any group that's out of power, decides that they want to take on an issue that's intractable. Something that everyone is aware of is a problem, and we cannot for the life of us figure out how to stop it. I don't know about you, it does not take much time to watch the news before you can have a list of intractable problems, right? Okay? So in your brain right now, you don't need to say it out loud, pick an intractable problem that you've observed in society. Okay, you all have probably at least one that you've picked. And the same reality of the intractable problem exists, which is this. You know when the presenting event occurs, problem has occurred, that one group of people will say, X, Y, and Z, right? And then the other side will come out and say A, B, and C, right? And then they will fight, and they will all go on the news networks, and everyone will fight on the news networks, and at some point, everyone's exhausted by the fighting, and nothing has changed. Again, you, could, you picked your own adventure on this. At some point, usually a younger generation goes, this is absurd. We have got to fix this problem. But joining either one of the two warring camps clearly is not going to fix the problem. They can't have a mature conversation because they've all picked sides. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a fantasy land. We're going to fill it with things that those po folks do not want to learn about, be it zombies, vampires, or whatever. And we are going to start the conversation with proxies. We're going to have this stand for that and that stand for this, and we're going to explore how this could or could not work in society, what's the ups, what's the down, what happens if we go this way and that way, is there a third option, a fifth option, a twelfth option, how do we solve it? And then the conversation occurs in the safe place because no one can get that passionate about the zombies and vampires, when they would lose their minds if they knew what we were really talking about. It's a way to come up with solutions. This is not different when we run into the apocalyptic literature in the Bible. These are people at a particular time in a particular place who are out of power because Rome is in control, if we're talking the New Testament or any number of other groups in control if we're talking the Old Testament. Okay? And what they're trying to do is take on a major question and deal with it there. And it depends on what text and where and when you're talking about this, right? Because it's scattered throughout the Bible. The key to it, though, the thing that people don't get about apocalyptic literature is not only do you have to go back and figure out what they were talking about and then derive what lessons can be learned. But apocalyptic literature, for all the darkness and griminess that it takes on, is really a message of hope. Because the entire concept behind it is that there is something that we at this moment cannot figure out how to solve, but I hope, I dream, that if we can move it to a different context, we can find an answer. Divergent, which is a dark, dark series of books and movies, is grimy, it's dark, it's fairly depressing. Hunger Games the same way, man, that is the most depressing ending of any book ever. I'm not gonna give any spoilers out. But here's the thing. Both of them are written with the hope of the things they're talking about never coming to pass. They're written so that we can deal with the problems that they present and address them now. is the hope of a greater day, a day that never becomes this, because we thought about where we were headed. See, that's why we talk about it in Advent. Like I said last week, the core part of Advent is the strength that is given by hope. The strength given not by some Pollyannish, rose-colored glasses hope, but the hope that exists when someone rolls up their sleeves and says, there's a problem, it's an issue, let's try to figure it out. That sort of hope. 
a hope that is derived as strength, a hope that carried the people of Israel from era to era, from slavery to freedom, and through slavery again. The hope that we as Christians walk in a world where we know we are never defeated, a world where we know that the answer to any question at any time is that we can roll up our sleeves, face the reality in front of us, and begin the hard work of making God's kingdom come. As you go out today, take a few minutes and ask yourself, where am I being called to roll up my sleeves and hope a hope that few are willing to do? Make God's kingdom come a little.